will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a sales assistant for a mail order company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. How can I help? I'd like some help with ordering a book. I've tried your website, but it says it's offline at the moment and to call this number. Oh, yes. I do apologise. We've been having some problems with it, but I can take the order over the phone if you like. That would be great. It's a gift, you see. Can I take your name, please? Yes, of course. It's Zara Freeman. Is that Zara with an S or a Z? With a Z. Z-A-R-A. -A. Just writing that down. Right. What was the title of the book you'd like me to order? I think it's called Future Words. No, hang on. Sorry. That's Future Worlds. OK, just typing that in. Uh, I can't seem to find it. Do you know the name of the author? I'll do a search. Yes, it's by a man called Richard Watson. Watson, as in W-A-T-S-O-N. Yes, that's right. Oh, yes. Here it is. It's only just been released. It's a self-help book. Is that right? Yes. Now, it costs £12.99. Yep, that's fine. OK. How would you like to pay? Is a debit card OK? Mm, no, sorry. We only accept credit cards. Oh, dear. Um, just let me check to see if I have it with me. Oh, yes. Here it is. Can you read me the long... Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Right, almost done. Now I just need the delivery details. Right, I've got my friend's address here. It's 62 Green Gardens, London, N22. Just typing that in. 52 Green Gardens... No, it's number 62. Now, what kind of delivery would you like? What are the options? There are two. The free delivery option takes five days, or you can pay an extra £2.25 to have it sent out first class tomorrow. That would come to a total of £15.24p. Hmm... Well, my friend's birthday is next week, so it should get there in time with the free delivery. So uh, I think I'll take that. Right. That means that it will be delivered on the 21st of February, any time from 8am to 6pm. Is that OK? Well, I know my friend leaves early for work, so would it be possible for him to pick it up from the local post office instead? I'm afraid that won't be possible, but I could add some special instructions for it to be left with someone else 
a neighbour, perhaps? Actually, yes. I have met the old lady who lives next door, and she's bound to be home. Could you leave it with her? Fine. I'll add that if he's not home, then the package should be left with the neighbour. That's great. Thanks very much for your help. My pleasure. Thank you for shopping. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear an orientation given to new students about technology services on campus. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the orientation and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone has enjoyed orientation week so far. I know that you all have been getting quite a bit of information, but I really do need to give you some more regarding the Information and Computer Services, ICS, here at Kudro College. I've been here long enough to remember when kids hoard their typewriters around. Having a computer, whether it is a desktop or laptop, is now indispensable. They are so necessary, in fact, that our school is willing to help students with financial aid, if they need it, in order to purchase a computer. If you want to know how the school can help you get a computer, please visit our website or the IECS Centre. Though we coordinate the One Student, One Computer program, our main task at ICS is to help students deal with any technical issues that they have. We have a help desk where students can call in and ask about any computer problems they have. At this time of the school year, the help desk assists students with connecting computers to the school network. Included in your orientation packets are instructions on how to do so. As you can see, the instructions for connecting a Windows-based PC is much more complicated than for an Apple computer. We actually recommend the latter because it is good for students to focus on their work, not on solving problems that come from the computer's operating system. If you call the help desk, you can also get help with things like connecting your printer. Best of all, if your computer is having major problems, you can bring it in and get it serviced. Before you hear the rest of the orientation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. I will tell you how to bring in your computer if you have any problems with it. If I'm not there, you can talk to the full-time attendant, Jacob. That's J-A-K-O-B, Bianchi. Jacob has many years of experience in computer service. Please feel free to ask him anything. He is there Monday through Friday and can figure out what you need help with. We are located in Taylor Building. Our extension is 7760. This year, we also have extended opening hours. We are open both weekdays and weekends. During the week, we are open from 9 to 7 and on Saturdays from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Fill out a form and if you need to, drop your computer off. We'll get it fixed right away. Thank you all for listening and good luck with your studies. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear three students, Steve, David, and Susan, discussing the different courses they attend. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Well, gentlemen, we've almost finished our second semester at this university. What do you think of all the courses we attend? On the whole, I'd say they're quite good, apart from social history, which I find to be a little too inexact. Yes, the lecturer's style is also very, very dull. I certainly agree with you there. Although I would say that the textbook is more interesting. Welfare state. The subtitle says, "An examination of social development in the twentieth century." Yes, welfare state is a good book, but look how many pages it has—458. I agree. It's just too long to be easily read. Far too long. Although it's certainly well written in parts. Yes, and if you compare it to the textbook for cultural studies, what's it called? Inner views, I think. No, that's the book for media studies, and we finished that subject last semester. The book you're thinking of is In Perspective. Oh, sorry, you're right, In Perspective, and the subtitle says A Comparison of Social Groups. Somewhat interesting, wouldn't you say? Well, mildly so, as is the subject, dealing as it does with such a wide variety of issues. But the book itself certainly oversimplifies a very complex subject. I agree. I also got annoyed at its constant oversimplification. Life is more complicated than what it suggests. Yes, but what you call oversimplifying may well be considered clarifying. Look at this other textbook, Government in Action. Some may say that it also oversimplifies, but it must do so in order to present a coherent picture of an equally complex subject. Government in Action. Which subjects? It's the textbook for political theory. Oh, I hate politics. That's why I don't like the active leadership subject either. And most of the stuff in that political theory textbook is based on the American system. You see, it's written by Americans, so it's not even relevant to us here. I'd agree with you there. It's not relevant to us at all, since our government uses the Westminster system. Yes, I suppose that is a problem. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, it seems we all have certain criticisms about the textbooks we're using, but at the same time, we all like some elements, at least, of the subjects we're studying. What's your favourite subject, David? I'm not sure. I like political theory, but cultural studies is by far the best, even better than political theory, which I also like, but just not as much. Why do you say that, Steve? I was thinking perhaps social history is worth considering as best. Social history is good, but I made my choice because the subject is relevant to this modern society. But so is social history, and I like the historical element, which the other subjects lack. Even political theory examines history only briefly and in a very narrow way, so I'd say social history is the most rewarding for me. What about you, Susan? I think social history is certainly very good, but political theory is, in fact, the best, since basically every human system boils down to politics. 
So, despite a certain irrelevancy in the details, the basic message remains as relevant as ever. Oh, Susan, you can't be serious. Let's ask Olive again. She's over there. Olive, which subject do you think is the best? Ah, a difficult question. I'm very interested in culture, so cultural studies is certainly my cup of tea. But I'm politically active also, and hope to pursue this as a career. So political theory would be the one I'd pick. I don't believe it. Even with that irrelevant textbook. Don't listen to him, Olive. You have a right to your own opinion. The end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about languages. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, in the first lecture on anthropology, we're going to look at languages and how they are disappearing fast, and what effect that's having on people and the world as a whole. We hear so much in the news about the possible extinction of animal and plant species in the world. It's a sad thing that one day certain animals will cease to exist, but how many of you are aware that the world's languages are facing a similar threat? Believe it or not, there are currently more than six thousand languages spoken in the world today, but experts believe that by the end of this century, this number will be reduced to half. And as each language dies, the culture and specialized knowledge of a community dies with it. The unique knowledge of the environment, local wildlife, plants, animals, and ecosystems, not to mention the cultural traditions of the people themselves, will become lost forever. In essence, each language is not just spoken or written words strung together. Language has the power to hold the entire history of a people. Approximately one language dies every two weeks. This is an unprecedented situation. Never before in history has there been this rate of rapid decline. Most human languages are spoken by relatively very few people. Let's put this into perspective. The Ethnologue, the leading authority on the world's languages, has put together a list of every living language known to man. There are over six thousand five hundred, of which six thousand have available population figures. Now, 109 million people speak just 10 of these languages, and they are the major languages of the world. At the opposite end of the scale, there are minority languages which are only spoken by a few people, and that's what this chart is illustrating. The number of languages is represented on the vertical axis, and the total number of languages that make up this group is an astounding 1,619. For each of these smaller language groups, the population range of speakers goes from one to nine hundred and ninety-nine. Even more incredible is the fact that out of these small languages, over two hundred of them have a speaker population ranging from just one to nine. Imagine only nine people speaking your language in the whole world, or even only one or two people. Now let's think geographically. In total, there are 516 languages that are nearly extinct, 
where only a few members of the older generation survive. When they die, the language will die with them, lost forever. The majority of nearly extinct languages come from the Pacific and the Americas, making up 74%, followed by Asia at 15%. Europe has the smallest percentage of languages that are nearly extinct, only 2%. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 37 to 40. Entire languages which have survived for centuries are disappearing as we speak. But why is this happening now? There are several reasons for a language's demise. Globalization has made the world smaller and technology has made it easier for people separated by vast distances to communicate in a common language which further ensures the growth in economic status for such communities. Minority languages have given way to the main languages of global communication, like English. On a social level, speakers may feel the minority language to be old-fashioned and behind the times. Maybe even speakers are slightly embarrassed to speak the language of their forefathers, identifying more with an international language that brings with it improved economic status. Now, some do argue that a reduction in the number of world languages is inevitable and anything to ease communication between nations is a good thing and, granted, there is a point to be made there, but what are the long-term implications of this? Consider this. Language, in both spoken and written form, is the vehicle for oral traditions to be passed down through generations. When a language becomes extinct, this link is broken and these oral traditions are lost. This has enormous implications for the identity of a community. We can't stop the changes that are happening in the world, but we can try to keep languages alive through language maintenance programs and by documenting languages before they disappear, so they can be studied and maybe even resurrected in the future. It's also important to remember that many people who speak threatened languages can neither read nor write. Helping them become literate goes a long way towards protecting the language. Preserving a language is not easy, but there have been exceptional cases where languages have been brought back to life. In Ireland, Irish Gaelic, once a dying language, through national determination is now spoken by 13% of the country's population. We'll go into what happened there in more detail in my second lecture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.